All right, I started recording. Go for it. Okay. Well, sorry, before you begin, I just want to say that uh, we are prepping a, a kind of a, so I was telling you guys about the Global Galaxy Steering Committee and all the government governance models. So we're, we're, we are, we're going to start pushing some documents towards community, so we will need comments. And uh, for example, we formed the uh, steering committee and actually Anis is a part of that committee along with Dan and uh, Jeremy here, I believe. So, but you'll see more soon. So on that note, Anis, go ahead. All right, um, I have to switch some tabs, so I may have to share, uh, reshare the screen because uh, uh, just the, the way the, the screen size works and, and the presentation mode. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about uh, Custis specifically and then uh, actually start a little bit broader than that about uh, how can we um, think about improving the Galaxy server uh, security across the community and then um, some methods for handling user accounts, groups, and secrets within, um, within Galaxy. So this is part of the um, Custis project that was funded by the NSF about 18 months ago in partnership with uh, Marlon Pierce from Indiana University and uh, Jim Bastian from NCSA. Um, and I wanted to talk about this to both collect feedback and just inform everybody about what has happened at a sort of a midpoint in, of this particular project. Um, and see where things can go, uh, what interests are at the, at the broader level. And so uh, the, the four topics I'd like to cover is one is these uh, recommendations for securing a Galaxy installation that we've undertaken for the past six months with collaboration with uh, Trusted CI. And talk about a, a completed implementation of delegating user authentication. So rather than implementing everything in Galaxy as uh, the, the, the trend has been over the last decade uh, to try to offload this and uh, authentication being one example of such uh, approach. Uh, and then talk about some future plans from the project standpoint about ideas on secret and uh, group management within Galaxy. And, and then an outcome that uh, came out because I gave this at the lab talk um, at Hopkins about 10 days ago. And so an idea emerged that maybe this uh, could benefit from having a new working group formed around these topics. Again, uh, interrupt at any point you'd, uh, you'd like. So to start off, you know, oftentimes, I mean, there is the, uh, the security uh, uh, repository on the Galaxy project that deals with technical issues that emerge as issues, um, you know, at the implementation level. But um, there's often a lot of um, sort of additional security around the technical implementation uh, that are more at the procedural and the policy level that can help secure a Galaxy server. So, uh, in, you know, things like uh, who has access to a given server, what data is allowed to be loaded, what kind of logs uh, does a does a process have uh, to be able to reconstruct. Um, uh, a potential scenario and all, and so that is the the focus of this. It's not about um, the implementation technical, uh, the technical implementation of uh, improving the security. So the motivators for this uh, have emerged over the past couple of years um, through active projects that um, a number of um, Galaxy um, members have have uh, won. One being AnvilProject.org. The other one being Galaxy for Cancer. Uh, and so the use cases are working with human genetic data, so protected data sets that public servers are not really capable of addressing. Oh, not, not really, they're not capable of addressing. And secondly, large data sets that are uh, very difficult to move um, onto a public server. Um, and, and so the implication is what uh, I'd like to sort of present and talk about here is the, after these projects um, have hit their stride and a lot of the implementation uh, work is done, what can Galaxy actually do and what the, can community um, expand this into with the, these implementations. And so the, the part that has been done in this sort of policy uh, on the policy side of things uh, has have mostly happened over the last six months. In uh, July last year, we did a security audit through an external firm uh, that took a look at the, the Cloudman application and the Galaxy Kubernetes deployment. They provided a report about the sort of implementation level um, 
details as to what can be improved to make this a more uh, a more robust implementation. Uh, there's still some outstanding work left on that. A, a couple of things have been addressed. The reason we chose um, the Kubernetes employment of Galaxy is because it represents the most unified form of deploying Galaxy, um, that it has the least dependency on uh, local infrastructure, meaning that uh, you know, while you can have a, a local handmade implementation that is, let's say, a 99% custom, you can have Ansible that is you know, some uh, lesser percentage um, custom and specific to a, to a location, uh, Kubernetes raises that to the next level where more and more of the deployment level is codified. And then so this seemed like a good target uh, for improving the implementation level um, uh, capabilities to, to adhere to the better security standards. Following that um, one-off audit, we engaged with trusted CI uh, through the Science Gateways Community Institute to lay this groundwork for improving the security uh, posture of Galaxy. So this is a combination of um, current look at kind of the implementation uh, and recommendations for how a given site can use that implementation um, at their local uh, location uh, to, to, provide, to implement the remainder of, of, of uh, controls. Uh, Engagement report is linked at this uh, at this URL that summarizes uh, what has happened in, during those uh, six months. And so, what's currently ongoing is part of this uh, talk today is the dissemination with the community, so everybody's aware that uh, this took place and what the outcomes of those uh, those engagements have been. Uh, and then, looking forward, uh, you know, this is certainly far from done. So, as part of the Anvil project, we've um, heard stories for the last year plus from the um, doc store team. They are doing this, but they're doing it officially. And it's been a year, it'll be another six months at the very least. Um, Terra team at the Broad spent at least two years doing the same. So if we wanna do this as a project, this is a multi-year um, engagement that we would, uh, we would need to um, sort of commit to. And uh, more detail about this, uh, this is like a short summary of it. Uh, so Anurag and I did for the Galaxy admin training. There's an hour long video at that uh, link that kind of dives into more of this in Anurag. There's uh, more talking about uh, the outcomes of, of this uh, collaboration and engagement. Um, in, in short lines as to, I guess, what you can expect from that video if you choose to watch it, um, is a look at the, how can Galaxy become um, more aligned with some of these compliance um, certifications? So the way this works, the way it's structured in the United States at least, is that there's this um, National Institute for Standards, NIST, and they have a catalog uh, called 853 that lists a number of controls that uh, enhance a security posture of a given deployment of, uh, of a given uh, software service. And so as a project, you would implement those controls or explain them, documenting. A lot of this process uh, comes down to documentation more so than the implementation. Of course, there's uh, implementation-based implications, um, but it's, it's not all implementation. So you have this process of you, know, you have to categorize uh, everything that makes up this service, uh, select which one of these services or controls you want to implement, implement them, assess the, the results, um, authorize. This is where official uh, compliance comes into the picture. So this is like a certified, um, a certified version of the controls that you have implemented. Um, this, you get an external auditor that performs the process, takes six months, they work with you. And at the end, you may get um, something called the FedRAMP uh, compliance. And that can be at uh, low, medium, or uh, strict levels, depending on how many controls you've implemented from this 853 catalog. And then from these security things, we can also talk about HIPAA as a private data, I mean, a protected data set compliance um, uh, requirement uh, that again, comes out of implementing these controls uh, and a specific deployment of the service. Um, and so the, the again, this, this is a multi-year uh, 
process, assuming that we want to undertake it. Uh, but there are certain lessons learned from doing this that can be implemented and can apply regardless of whether this is uh, trending toward a compliance-based Galaxy installation or not. And so uh, a very practical outcome uh, of the engagement with Trusted CI was the Galaxy System Security Plan document or the SSP, which lists a set of controls and recommendations on how to improve the security posture of a Galaxy installation. So this does include this catalog of components, includes a set of deployment architecture diagrams. Um, and so I've linked this document here at bit.ly slash GXY SSP. Uh, and let's see if, um, so here's the, uh, here's the document that, um, and it's, it's available for anybody to, uh, to take a look at and see what the outcomes of, of it are. Um, like I said, it has a number of controls that are stemming from that NIST 853 um, document. Uh, we went with the low uh, classification of uh, which controls we considered. It provides a set of, um, uh, well, I'll scroll down through the document a bit, but uh, you know, it's, it's a sizable one that it sort of creates a catalog of all the components that make up a given deployment, in this case, the Galaxy on, on Kubernetes. It talks about the, uh, you know, the architecture diagrams, the flow diagrams of how uh, processes interact. And all of this is in service of creating recommendations. Um, I can find some now. Um, um, it's the lower that, uh, that were recommended by Trusted CI saying that, um, you know, for example, um, we have these access control policies and procedures. So this is a site dependent solution saying like who has access to SSH, who has access to Galaxy Admin and all. And then you can see uh, a lot of these controls are in fact site dependent. However, some um, were classified as, um, as things that can be implemented at the deployment um, level. And, and I won't go through you know, these, but, but that was the, the outcome at, at this point. Some of these, of course, remain as undone. They are highlighted, I think, lower in the document as to things that uh, uh, could and should be improved at the deployment level. Okay. So that, uh, with that, I, you know, unless there are questions, of course, uh, uh, wrap up the, uh, the sort of the first agenda item for, for the talk, which talked about these, uh, how to secure, provide a better, more secure Galaxy installation and what, uh, what it take for Galaxy as a whole uh, to trend toward a, a compliance-based installation. And so I'll, I'll uh, shift on to the kind of more specific um, outcomes of the Custis project. Um, so Custis has these three aims. Um, one is management of user accounts and identities uh, through an external service. Secondly is management of secrets uh, needed by science gateways. Secrets can include tokens, they can include uh, SSH keys, they can include cloud access keys. And then um, third aim is the controlled uh, access to digital objects across uh, across instances of, of science gateways. And so I'll talk, you know, so I'll say in, in the context of Galaxy a little bit more on what these aims really mean. So the first one, uh, external authentication means that we can uh, delegate user login from having a local uh, based username and password stored in the Galaxy server. We can log in with existing credentials, whether that be social identities such as Google or institutional identities such as the employment institution and build this natively into, um, into Galaxy so it, it provides a good user experience uh, without having to implement all of this in Galaxy itself. Two is uh, storing uh, secrets. So Amazon um, or Google or, or or key, uh, Jetstream, for example, uh, SS, uh, keys to, to access that cloud, uh, to be able to access these secrets without those, those having to be stored in a local database. And then lastly uh, is the, the group management. So ability, give ability to users to sort of self-organize into groups. So if you, if you have a team you're working on a paper with, or you have a lab, 
uh, and you want to share a given history with five people, you're not having to select five people individually, but you can basically say, I want to share this with um, my Hopkins uh, teammates and select all of them um, that have once been added to uh, the Hopkins teammates group or team. Uh, so, uh, so before we go into sort of the details, I guess at the high level, um, so the Custis uh, ecosystem is um, is depicted here. The idea is that um, before too long, there will be uh, a service running for the world available at usecustis.org. It is currently still in a, in a testing phase, so not actually available at this URL, but uh, but it's coming. Um, the software that runs this is derived from the Apache uh, Airbata Custis uh, repository on GitHub, and it's reusing uh, Keycloak for identity and user management and Vault for sequence management. And this is going to be uh, uh, applied for as, a, as an Apache project uh, as it matures a little bit. Um, the service itself runs uh, is deployed via Helm chart running on Cloudman as one of our things, and, and it's deployed at the Indiana University uh, Data Center in their enterprise uh, portion of the data center that is intended to run services such as uh, payroll and things that, that have high quality of service uh, assurances at, from the, the data center operators. And then uh, for the authentication itself, uh, which is, like I said, externalized to uh, identity providers that already exist, uh, it's integrated with CI logon. And then on top of that, we have Science Gateways, uh, Galaxy and Ervada being uh, the two flagship ones. And so we have to implement these wedges in these um, kind of dedicated Science Gateways that allow simple integration with Custis for a variety of deployments. But it's not limited to these projects. Um, other science gateways uh, can implement, can integrate with Custos either more lightweight um, or, or more integrated as in case of Galaxy. So for example, authentication can flow um, via the CI logons UI, or it can be embedded into uh, the, the science gateways UI as if the case has been in Galaxy to provide a more, um, a nicer experience for the users. So, um, there at, at usegalaxy.org, I mean, sorry, at, at usecustos.org, as I said, there is, uh, there will be a portal uh, where people can interact with Custos. This is predominantly intended for admins as a one-off activity, not, not something you go to regularly. As I said, however, usecustos.org is still not available. Uh, it's still in development. Uh, and so there's this uh, test server available at testdrive.usecustos.org where you can log in and see what the, uh, what the portal looks like. At the moment, um, so, the, so the, the, the actions that are envisioned for this portal um, fall into these three categories. One is the ability to register new client applications. Uh, that's the only currently available uh, feature in this uh, test period. The ability that, or what that gives you is the ability to register a new application, uh, meaning you get the, the secret and the token that identifies this application with an identity provider and is brokered through Custos. Uh, so this action is to be performed once by an admin. You get those secrets, put them into the config files in Galaxy, uh, and from there on, all the users gain access to uh, to that enabled capability of logging in with the uh, external credentials. So the intention is to be a self-serve process, but um, because of the restrictions on the, from the in common and trusted CI groups, uh, there has to be manual approval process uh, before you actually get the token. So the, the more future facing uh, components of this portal are gonna be the ability to manage secrets uh, so natively, as I show in, in the context of Galaxy, some uh, uh, envision plans. Uh, this should be linked from the app, from the science gateway itself. Uh, but as a user, you can still go in and see like an aggregate view of all your secrets that you might have stored across different science gateways. Um, and, and this is going to be centrally managed through multiple apps. So in case we have um, multiple Galaxy servers, different apps, in principle, uh, it, it would be possible for a user to access those the secrets, even though they were stored once. And, uh, and lastly, the idea is that uh, we can upload sensitive content from that being stored in the uh, in the application itself. Uh, and lastly, the ability to manage users and groups. Uh, so again, what I, what I mentioned, if you want to create uh, uh, a 
group such as a lab or a classroom uh, and treat that as a single entity. Uh, capabilities for doing that will be added to the portal um, in, in due time um, and be able to share secrets. You know, I'll tie this more to Galaxy uh, in time. So, so I'll talk about the, the thing that's have ha that has happened over the last year or so, namely the features that have been enabled in Galaxy um, where, um, where somebody can, can start consuming them. Um, so these were, of course, built into the core framework of Galaxy. Uh, the idea is that they provide a more native experience for the users. So instead of being redirected to the CI logon, for example, to log in with an external identity, you can choose the external identity provider right from the Galaxy UI. I'll show that. Um, uh, secondly, it, it can be deployed with less configuration changes or with only configuration changes, less changes to the, the gateway. Again, uh, I'll show an example of that as well. Um, and from the sort of project management's perspective, uh, we, we may get uh, better insights into users' affiliations if they choose to sign in with their institution as opposed to a social identity, um, such as Google, where, where we don't know where users are actually coming from. Uh, something that's useful for the funding agencies to, uh, to see. Um, so the, the benefits that I uh, feel we gain with uh, integrating with Custos is that uh, we don't have to store local username and passwords. Personally, I don't use sites that uh, require me to log in with a username and password. I want my Google login and not have to remember another password ever. Uh, so with that, we can we can do that in Galaxy. Um, Secondly, we can link multiple identities to the same Galaxy account. So whether it's your Google account, your Hopkins account, uh, it's you can choose to log in with either one. Um, and, and this may have implications down the line as those services have uh, additional capabilities um, uh, linked to an institution. So for example, if um, Hopkins is to expand the capacity of one of the Galaxy public servers for its users, um, you will be able to do that by having that linkage uh, available. Uh, and then uh, this is something that I have a question for everybody here, uh, that you might be able to carry the same identity across the usegalaxy.star servers, uh, which I think from the user's perspective would be uh, a very nice step in the right direction. And the secrets management, like I said, it's, it's the ability to store sensitive content uh, in Custos and retrieve it from an application from Galaxy. Uh, things like the uh, dbgap, uh, SRA, tokens or cloud store, username and password, instead of A, disabling those tools on a server or B, uh, deciding to store the sensitive data in the Galaxy database, uh, we can fetch that um, from, from a remote location. Um, again, similarly, sort of the cloud credentials from cloud launch um, could be fetched instead of being stored locally. And, and ultimately, the stuff I talked about in the first portion of the presentation is that we can improve the security posture of uh, use Galaxy servers by not having to store a lot of the sensitive content, keep the login information and all as we presumably migrate toward a more uh, compliance-based installation. And so the external authentication, um, this is a, a demo um, of what, uh, what this looks like in Galaxy. So this is a, a local installation of Galaxy. So I can log in here with my um, uh, local username and password as, in all, as is available on, on Galaxy at the moment, uh, right? And so, but I don't have any external identities that have been uh, linked. So if I log out and I try to log in here with the choice, so this is what I was saying, it's integrated with Galaxy, so it provides this native experience where you can choose from, I think there's over 3,000 identity providers. Um, if I choose the uh, Johns Hopkins as a list and say sign in, um, I'll be presented with this, uh, well, of course, the, um, the login at the institution. Uh, and then I'll be, I'll be warned here by Galaxy uh, that I may be creating a duplicate account this is uh, going to be, so we had a little bit of discussion over the last week. Um, we'll, we'll modify this. The key here being that users need to differentiate whether they are creating a new account or um, linking an existing username and password based account with, um, with their existing uh, account. And so in this case, because I already have an account, I don't wanna create a new account. 
as I go back to login, um, login with as a username and password. And then from here, I can link that external identity um, once. Select A, you say login, it'll go through the OAuth flow. And so now I'm, I continue to be logged in as uh, with my username and password ID. But if I log out, I can go back here and instead of logging in for username and password, I can log in through, uh, through the IDP provider. Uh, and now it'll just you know, log in again, uh, maintaining that um, original username that was, uh, that was linked. Um, so that's that, that's the, the external authentication card um, that's available. We haven't rolled it out uh, to main yet, but uh, because of some of the, the recent suggestions that we've received, uh, so that's that's hopefully coming. Uh, the other thing that's, that this allows is um, filtering the login institutions. So if a given Galaxy deployment does not want to allow any institution from that list of 3000 to log in, but like institution-based uh, logins only. Uh, currently that was enabled through this email domain allow list file where it had to list domains and subdomains. So for Hopkins, there were at least three subdomains that needed to be explicitly listed. Um, because of the way the in common uh, IDP providers work, uh, there has to be a unique ID that uh, corresponds to a given IDP. And so here, if we uh, we can now uh, specify this list that um, that list that includes all of the all of the subdomains that might exist, and so the full list is available here for uh, for listing which identity uh, provider should be included on in a given list. And at that point, that list of three thousand will be filtered um, to whatever is included in, in this list. In this case, it would be just Hopkins. And so this, we get to the, the, the sort of the one but last part of the presentation, uh, which is uh, features planned um, or discussed a little bit, at least for the remaining uh, uh, period of the Custis project and hopefully beyond, hopefully broader, if people find interest in this. This said, uh, the, the three services that Custis provide, one is the identity management, we've seen the implementation of that. Second one is the, the secrets service. So it allows us to, log, to store tokens, passwords, uh, access keys, SSH keys uh, that can then be accessed by, uh, by Galaxy. So again, like a Dropbox token instead of storing locally uh, for accessing users' individual tokens through the upload uh, data plugin um, mechanism that, that could be stored in, in Custos and retrieved. Um, so what, what would this, I guess, at the, the very high level uh, look like at the moment? If we do this Dropbox token, uh, it's stored in the local database and, and retrieved when the um, um, when data is being uploaded. So in case it would be um, retrieved, stored via the API and retrieved via the API in the uh, Custos Secret Service, uh, which behind the scenes is stored in the, um, in the vault. And and user, if they choose to, they can manage it uh, through the portal um, in, in case they have multiples and, and want to do um, sort of aggregate or bulk uh, additions. So something that uh, might be possible, or uh, it's at, at a policy level, uh, would be possible is for a user uh, to be able to store this token once uh, to say, I'm on usegalaxy.org. I want to link my Dropbox um, account to this um, to my uh, account, and do so once uh, through the API. This, this secret gets stored in Custos, and then the next time uh, the user goes to one of the other Use Galaxy servers, and because the, through the identity, uh, if they use this, the same identity uh, through through an IDP on both servers, they can get authenticated as one of the same or recognized as one of the same user uh, on, on Custos. And so be able to retrieve that same uh, secret from a different server, uh, similarly from other applications uh, such as Cloud Launch. However, in order for this to work at the sort of Custos slash Keycloak implementation levels, uh, both of these servers or all of these servers 
would need to be made part of the same realm um, in, in the local terminology. And so it would require basically coordination and agreement across these used Galaxy servers to say that they are different tenants within the same realm uh, and can see each other's users. So we would get away from, uh, we would slowly start getting away from each Galaxy server being a completely independent uh, island and start uh, aggregating that information uh, across multiple use Galaxy uh, dot star federations. So this is something that uh, you know, needs to be, I guess, uh, uh, talked about, but uh, are there any gut feeling reactions uh, about this, whether this would be a desirable feature from both users and an admin's perspective or a, or a no, no topic, uh, you know, GDRP becomes uh, maybe a bigger concern in, in this case for servers that are not in Europe, but have to adhere to some of these rules. So anyway, it's um, any, any comments? Um, I actually, I have a question on the token actually. Uh, so we're not supposed to use the token, right? That's a developer setting. Uh, normally you would need to do the OAuth flow and get a regular uh, authorization from Dropbox. Uh, how do you see Custos fitting into that? Does, could that help us there? Um. I mean, it, it's uh, it, it's much simpler for the user if we implement the OAuth flow. So yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've done the Dropbox thing and it didn't work for me, uh, but I, I know a lot of people it has worked for. Um, so so I agree that it, it would, OAuth flow would be simpler. Um, I, so I we know. need to refresh the token, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I I don't have an answer for you. Uh, something to I guess. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that would be better, yes. Um, I don't know the implementation bit still. Um, but you know, okay, so a Dropbox token, if we get away from that, uh, you know, there are other examples of keys that can be stored that, that don't have OAuth implemented. Um, oh yeah, for sure. Like uh, username and password must be one of the most requested features we have um, yeah. for tools that, Need to do authentication, authenticated actions. That would be really good. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll move on. I don't know. I don't know what time. What time it is actually? Um, so, um, so the, the next kind of the last category or the last aim of of the Custis uh, project, at least is this ability to provide uh, groups and user management, uh, allowing users to sort of self-organize into groups or teams. So you can imagine having a classroom or a lab uh, that you can share artifacts with. So for, uh, for training, for a workshop, or for a classroom setting, uh, a teacher can provide a sample history. And instead of having to select 30 or 200 students, um, every time they want to share any history, uh, they can instead say, you know, here's a group and every time I share it with a group. Uh, secondly, group leads can then monitor what has happened across a given group. I have a more specific example about that. Um, and you can permit access to secrets. So uh, in case you have a lab and you, for example, as a PI have a DB gap authorization where you, which you can delegate to your uh, lab members, postdocs, um, uh, whoever makes up the lab, uh, instead of giving them the username and password that they have to plug in themselves, you can just allow them access to the secret uh, as a member of this lab group. Um, and, and lastly, kind of imagine this idea that you can create a, a group uh, overview dashboard to see what's going on across multiple people if you again, or maybe a PI or something at, uh, at an institution and need to track what's going on within Galaxy. Um, so so a, a potential implement, you know, a view of what this might look like uh, in terms of the groups in Galaxy. So the ability to, to create these groups as an individual, as a member, as a user of Galaxy, you can create a um, group by adding members of the group once, create a group. And then from there, you can say manage secrets. 
so to say that you know this group has access to these uh, secrets and and from there on again they don't actually have to have a view into what the secret is uh, but can simply get uh, get access to whatever the implication of that um, of that is. Uh, the second thing is kind of going toward this group view, sort of the inverse of you being able to share something with a group, being able to consume something from a group. So the way we have the, the multi-history view, you can imagine instead of all those histories being your own, they can be from multiple uh, users in an aggregate view. Um, and you see, again, a classroom setting, for example, is a great example. You can hand out homework uh, and retrieve uh, feedback that way instead of having to you know, import a bunch of histories uh, and, and look at them, browse and click around. Uh, so uh, this one, I, I, I admit it's uh, probably a very uh, large amount of work uh, that would certainly require some buy-in from a broader um, group of people than, than the effort on this project can actually sustain. But uh, I see a lot of use cases for this, so maybe there's enough interest. And so, uh, so far, again, um, this have been the people that have been involved um, with implementing what's been implemented and planning, making uh, the agenda for what's coming, uh, working on the trusted CI engagement. Uh, and the last thing um, I wanna talk about is this, uh, the idea of a new working group that uh, emerged at the Hopkins weekly lab meetings. The idea would be to explore sort of these recommendations and solutions for improving the Galaxy server security posture. So pushing further on the uh, the engagement that took place with uh, with Trusted CI, the Galaxy uh, SSP document, uh, compliance-based um, uh, needs um, to projects like the ITCR, for example, or namely the Galaxy for Cancer, where there's going to be some stricter requirements. What can we do um, at the deployment level to make sure this is um, adequately secure? Secondly, coordinate development of OTC uh, OT and approaches. I, you know, I know we have two parallel implementations, uh, one based on PSA and this other one based on Keycloak. Um, I have a fairly strong opinion that we should implement less in Galaxy and delegate more. And so instead of implementing just the, whatever, we can just delegate it to an external provider of services. Um, uh, key cloak being an example, but I get at least coordinating that across the project would be nice. Um, and, and lastly, sort of work toward adding support for these groups and more generally role-based access controls in, in Galaxy over you know, the, the years to come so that some of these uh, group management capabilities become um, possible. And so I, I added a little link down here. I'd uh, propose a a working group uh, to tackle some of these. See if we can find a periodic meeting time um, that would kind of keep interested those interested in interested in, in working toward the same goal. So that's um, that's what I have. In case there's, of course, feedback, comments, ideas. So we, I mean, I guess the major thing here is uh, we need to implement then the role-based access control um, in a way uh, and, and tie it to our database. So whatever we do, we don't think we can just use an external uh, service right away. We'd always have to have an adapter. Um, yeah. So I don't know if maybe the roles that we already have can can do this so that uh, the external provider would just do the linking of the roles and groups we have. Um, I mean, it could, right? I mean, it was, yeah, we, we, we talked about this, of, I don't know, two, three months ago, um, that it, it could just, you know, there could be a local implementation. It's like a pluggable based implementation um, that, that provides a local imp you know, local plugin that stores everything in the database, uh, maybe with limited capability, um, or just defaults to to something, uh, and then plug in an external provider um, that provides a, the native implementation or the the. You know, so, yeah, I mean, this is an architectural 
I mean, yeah, it, it will be interesting to to see what we can do because um, sort of not having a real RBAC setting uh, or something that is really complicated also limits us in uh, implementing GraphQL, for example, uh, where typically you do that against the uh, RBAC. Um, but it's all much, much simpler than what Galaxy does, right? So you typically just check, can the user do this action? But for us, it's uh, it's a whole hierarchy that is encoded in the relationships in the database. Uh, so it sounds like super challenging. Mm, okay. I mean, it's definitely worth thinking about. So to, to ask a question, Marius, what you just described, the, uh, the existing database has a bunch of fields and columns in the actual tables, which have owners or group, group IDs or whatever for our current system. Is that what you're describing? Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a mixed thing. So everything has an owner, um, mostly, I think. Um, and then we have uh, roles. You, you, welded it, you welded it to the data tables. They aren't separate tables that are joined or something like that. So it's not going to be easy to, to pull them off. No, they're separate. They're separate tables. There's a, okay. I mean, we have this hybrid thing, right? Um, yeah, it's pretty intense. It's a very custom implementation of yeah. RBAC, I guess, is what, what Marius is getting at. Yeah, it'd be a lot easier if it were like a, a bunch of just joined tables, you know, that we could stop using. So the adapter idea might make a lot of sense though, right? So if we can re, if we can build an interface such that we could point it at ours or an external one, I mean, trying to sync stuff is just going to be a mess, right? Yeah, and that was also what I was thinking that we should have some adapters that we can use our own database or some external if the user is a kind of external user. It would be interesting to, to see if uh, anyone is already working on that uh, from other projects. I think Norway, some, someone in Norway was doing some external uh, kind of role management connected to Galaxy. Nikolai Vazov, I think, was working on something. But I, I, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with this. Just. Ennis, do you have um, any ideas about um, how like we could balance? I mean, I, I, I love the idea of the new working group and I love the idea of it having tasks, but then it, it seems like um, it seems like we, we're like at capacity and then if we just add a new group and a bunch of new tasks, um, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, frankly, there's a project I'd love to work on, right? This is, sounds really cool, really valuable. Um, but yeah, it's. Yeah, the resource capacity is, a, you know, we're certainly at capacity. So I, I, that I don't really have an answer for. I, you know, the hope is that we continue to grow. And, you know, if it's at a forefront of the planning, you know, maybe something else, uh, you know, if this is important, if this is of interest, maybe something gets, you know, in, instead of having three or five things on uh, a to-do list for a couple of other groups, maybe it drops to, you know, two or four things and a couple of things get added to this group. Um, so it, it's a balancing act. Absolutely. I, I don't, I don't, you yeah. know, we come up with more people, that would be the answer, but uh, yeah making strides in that, but uh, it's not growing fast enough as the ideas are brewing. 
I mean, Custis is, so there's, there's people at Indiana that are working on a lot of this. Um, so it can certainly be in coordination with them. They're very eager and happy. Um, they would be thrilled to see more of it adopted. Uh, so there's some potential for both actual effort uh, likely and, and certainly the, you know, guidance and, and uh, compromises in terms of what the capabilities needed are uh, as the implementation on, on their side happens as well. So well, maybe that's a helping step in the right direction. Okay, is there, um, um, sh should we move on to the next topic? Um, I mean, maybe Alex? just, a, oh. yeah. maybe just a question. Ennis, do you know how Custis is working with GA4GH Passport and um, the Life Science AI and those projects? It's not. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, those are unfortunately parallel efforts. Um, so the passport is funded by the NIH through the RAS mechanism. Uh, this is funded by the NSF. Um, Jim Bassney, who is the most qualified person, has become aware of passport. Uh, the passport about four months ago, maybe or so. So and it does look interesting. Uh, they have what I call a you know, very similar, if not parallel implementation called side tokens that functionally enables a very similar um, capability. But unfortunately, uh, those were not known to each other until kind of recently. Okay. Um, Alex, do you want to take over and talk a little bit about um, ITs on Kubernetes? Oh, sure. I mean, I mostly just wanted to, I guess, bring up that I got them to work on Kubernetes with service and ingress without the reverse proxy. Uh, the only change in the managers that needed to be done was removing the encoded job ID, either replacing it with just the job ID itself or removing it altogether. I thought that's okay because the token is the UUID that gets generated for each IT. So I thought the URL would still be unique. Wanted to make sure that that assumption is true. And then also if there are objections to doing it without the reverse proxy or if Somebody thinks it's better to do it with the reverse proxy and how that would work behind the Leo proxy and or yeah, just, I mean, at least start the conversation now. We can also just break off at a later time with whoever knows ITs and or, and or cares about ITs. I don't know. Yes, a lot of people care about ITs. I mean, I think that sounds awesome. Like, I don't think we're tied to the proxy, so that's cool. Uh, my, uh, Alex, you were showing that uh, high glass works. Uh, is that somehow transferable to main in some form or shape or any other instances? As long as there is a Kubernetes cluster that is exposed, it should work anywhere. It works on GKE, it works on the clusters that we deploy so I, I don't know what the lim I know there are some limitations with the cluster that main is using. In theory, I could just, you know, I can boot up a cluster on our jet stream allocation for main and we could use that. <laughs> so could make it work like that relatively fast, but I don't know about the cluster that main's currently using what the limitations are. Last question to Nate. 
he, he added a comment in the chat saying that it should work. Uh, Nate, do you have any thoughts about removing the reverse proxy? Just using Kubernetes. Nate has no microphone. Okay. Well, so I would, I would be careful about move, removing that other uniquely identified part of that from a security perspective, right? I don't have a claim against the proxy, that's fine, but the token is not guaranteed to be unique, right? It's a combination of the item and the token that gives you the security. Okay, uh, would it be possible to encode the job ID not using so right now it was using chance.security, so it needed to happen somewhere where chance comes from the web handler, I'm guessing. Um, but the way I did it, everything's happening in the runner. So if we can just like, you know, salt it more generically or encode it more generically without using chance security, then I can put it back. So we should be able to the do runner. it trans, yeah. Yeah, so you have app.security access in the runner. Okay. We, we can definitely yeah, fix can, that. I can put it back with that then. Okay. And I still would like to meet for a longer conversation. I'm meeting next Friday with Rob to talk about in Anvil how it will work with the Leo proxy and what they need, what we need from them. Um, so ideally before that, just even a brief conversation with people who designed ITs originally, like just know IT as well, just to make sure that I'm not doing everything wrong and just appears to be working. <laughs> Absolutely. When's that? Sometime when Nate has a microphone. Daddy. When, I mean, any that before, call again? It's on Friday, so anytime before the next Friday or anytime next week, really. Okay, not tomorrow. Yeah, no, not tomorrow, next Friday. All right, sorry, I, I got out my laptop, so now I have a microphone. <laughs> uh, I wasn't expecting to talk. Um, uh, so what, what was your question about removing the proxy? Yeah, can we delegate to Kubernetes to handle the the, the proxying to the IT? Well, is, is this about uh, the, the integrated proxy when Galaxy is running in Kubernetes itself? Because you certainly don't need the two-level proxy. Or was it using Ingress as the proxy? Well, right now, so basically the way I did it is I'm assuming there's an Ingress controller in the cluster. Because mm -hmm. for the clusters that we use, that's how we're exposing Galaxy. Right. So then. I removed everything from the, um, I put the configure entry points right in the job runner and then just get the token from the database. You form the URL and when you're launching the job at the same time, you launch a service and an ingress or the job runner launches a service and an ingress that exposes that IT at the unique URL. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. Like in uh, what the technical terms are for when it's a reverse proxy versus a normal proxy versus yeah whatever but sure um, so so instead of running the proxy um, and having the traffic go through that you launch a service that that then uh, well you launch a, a proxy service in Kubernetes but it's yes, the uh, Kubernetes yeah. proxy not yep yeah. yeah. I don't think there's any reason why that would not be a good solution for Kubernetes, yeah. Do you think that's feasible for main as well? Uh, no, because main doesn't run inside Kubernetes. Well, but the ITs are running on Kubernetes? Yes. So yeah. couldn't we just expose an Ingress controller there and do it the same way? Uh, you're gonna have to map And maybe you could, I mean, so the host name is going to point at, I guess the, hmm. 
And the, the, way, the way it's done with the DNS is just a wildcard that's pointing at right. where the ingest controller is. So it's just okay. one wildcard DNS towards the IP of the ingest controller and the subdomains just work. That could work then, yes, I think. I'll take a look at the implementation and see if I can think of any reason why it wouldn't, but. All right, well, awesome everyone. Thanks for the good meeting. Um, Alex, I mean, should we schedule that meeting for next week right now or do you wanna? Oh, I mean, if there's a time that everybody has free, we can. If not, I can send a when is good or something. Oh, I guess raise your hand if, or like say something in the chat or Slack me if you wanna be in that meeting. And I don't know, or I can just send it on the public channel and everybody can see. All right, I'm gonna stop recording. Thanks all.